Welcome everybody um, to the GW4 Water Security Alliance uh, weekly seminar series. If you've been following, following the series, um, I'm sure you'll know that PhD researchers um, from the Fresh CDT um, have been inviting speakers and chairing the sessions this term, so that includes me. Um, so, oh, can I get to the next slide? There we go. Um, so this series features a guest speaker each week and is aimed at sparking discussion and knowledge exchange between academics, researchers, water professionals and students. And these seminars are hybrid um, when possible, but are always accessible via Zoom. So you can register via Eventbrite to, um, to view future seminars. And you can also view past seminars on the Water Security Alliance website, which is just um, linked above on screen. Um, if you're a member of the Water Security Alliance Early Career Researchers com Community um, and you're interested in chairing a session in the future, um, you can contact WSA info at cardiff.ac.uk. Um, and I'm sure someone can post that in the chat for you or I can um, if you're interested. So I will just uh, quickly introduce myself and then I will um, introduce our speakers today. Um, so hi, I'm Emma. I'm a P PhD researcher at Cardiff University and I am looking at the um, long-term trends in river invertebrate communities. Um, so I'm, I'm sure, as most of you know, the status of UK rivers has become an increasingly hot topic um, and is becoming particularly well covered in the media, especially surrounding uh, combined sewer overflows um, and the impact of agricultural practices. So it's a particularly interesting topic to be working in. Uh, so I'm looking at long-term trends in river invertebrates. So invertebrates are particularly useful at um, looking at how biodiversity is responding to changing environmental conditions. And they can also be used to, as indicators to look at, um, at how these environmental conditions are changing because they're very, very, very responsive to these. Um, and they're also fairly easy to collect and they're routinely collected and monitored by the Environment Agency and NRW. So I'm working with this um, routine monitoring data collected over almost 30 years from 1991 to 2019 to try and identify national trends in, for example, family richness, um, or also, and also looking at the communities present and how this is changing. Um, so I've just linked um, a figure in there um, from my work, and we've largely seen improvements in um, richness. So this has increased by about 15%, and there's been a shift towards more pollution sensitive taxa. Um, so I'm now looking at what's driving these trends, uh, for example, land use, um, water quality, and also river discharge. Um, so if that's interesting to you, I've included a QR code um, and that will send you to uh, a report that I did uh, alongside my supervisors for the Environment Agency. So this is just England based, um, but yeah, that's there if you're interested. Uh, so enough about me. Um, today we're having a talk about the Upper Colmy Catchment Project, um, which I think is a particularly exciting talk as it's great to hear about work that's um, actually being done to benefit freshwater environments and people. So our speakers today are Dewi, who uh, comes from a background of working in the uplands on land management, access and conservation, who's worked for the National Trust in Kamidwal and then in Snowdonia National Park as a senior warden. And he's been the project manager for the National Trust Upper Conway Catchment Project since 2015. And we're also joined by Sarah, um, who switched from a career in outdoor education to protecting the environment and she's worked for the Environment Agency and their Natural Resources Wales as a Senior Environment Officer for Conwy. Um, and this is in, this has included working closely with the National Trust on the Upper Conwy catchment since 2015. Um, so just briefly before I hand over, just make sure that your microphones are muted um, and try to get them muted throughout the talk. And if you've got any questions, it would be great if you could post them in the chat um, for us to ask at the end of the talk. So I will just stop sharing my screen and I will hand over. So yeah, hello. Um, thanks for the invitation to come and speak with you today um, on behalf of Sarah and myself. Um, it's, we're going to try and give you a, an overview of um, the work that we've done in the last sort of seven years or so um, and tell, us, tell you a bit about the, the, the partnership between National Trust and NRW um, and yeah, some of the um, exciting things that we'll have coming over the horizon as well, hopefully. So um, yeah, so... Um, I think uh, we're going to do a bit of a double act here, Sarah and myself. So um, Sarah's going to kick off with the next slide in a second. I'll be, I'll be driving the presentation, so fasten your seatbelts. It might, might not go uh, as, as well as planned. 
Um, so yeah, it's going to be Sarah, then myself, and toing and froing, and then uh, it'll be Q and A at the end. Uh, off we go. So the Upper Conway catchment is part of the National Trust Riverlands Programme, which you may have heard of. This is a partnership project with Natural Resources Wales in Wales and the Environment Agency in England. Um, it's an ambitious project looking at improving rivers for water quality, habitats, connecting people to nature and also making long term sustainable change. Riverlands is currently focused in 12 catchments, which are shown on the map. And the Conway catchment is number six on the map. It's the only project in Wales. Okay. So the Upper Conway project is a landscape scale project to improve the quality of the environment and the heritage of the catchment, working with local communities to deliver the goals of the Wellbeing Act. So the top wheel is the National Trust Land Outdoor and Nature Goals, making the land healthy, rich in wildlife, culture, productivity, as well as being beautiful and enjoyed. The bottom wheel is the Wellbeing Wheel, which is from the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which is a piece of Welsh legislation. Um, and these include goals such as making a healthier Wales and a more resilient Wales with vibrant culture and cohesive communities. Yeah. So we realised fairly early on that working together, you know, the goals of both organisations are very similar and we could deliver more for the people and environment of Wales by working together and also we could get there quicker. So this by graphic just shows that two organisations working together going in the same direction. So the Conway catchment is in North Wales. Uh, the River Conway starts at the top in the Mignite, which is a vast area of upland peat, and it winds its way down the catchment, passing through Bethesda Coid and Clanroost, and then eventually joining the Irish Sea at Conway. Um, the Upper Conway catchment area is the dark green bit of the map, which covers about 3% of Wales, 337 kilometres squared, and it encompasses 10 different water body catchments in the area, 19 triple SIs, three SACs, and one SPA. So if we zoom in a bit further into that dark green area, um, the land in green is Welsh Government Estate, managed by Natural Resources Wales, and the land in orange is National Trust owned land, often with 10 farmers in place. So we looked at the land and went, I've got about 50% of the land between the two organisations to show change. And then we found that Voilas Estate, which is a private estate in yellow, is also a big landowner in the area as well. And they also agreed to come on as part of the project. So between you know, those three partners, we've got ownership over 70% of the land in the area which means it's a good place you can actually show and demonstrate landscape scale change. Thank you, Sarah. Um, over to me, I believe. Um, so yeah, sorry about the, the, the slide glitches there. I'm gonna stick to this format because it uh, seems to be working better. Um, so where did the project begin? Um, it started um, pretty much where the river starts at, up at the head of the catchment um, on the Mignite, which is a um, large area of blanket bog, um, which is parts of which are owned by the National Trust. Um, and it all began with peatland restoration, um, probably going back to 2007, we, we reckon, when the first sort of um, tentative steps were, were taken towards doing um, restoration of this, this uh, modified landscape. Um, so the ditches that you see in the, in the main photo there um, were, were put in over various stages and various phases of time, really. Um, and they were done predominantly by, um, well, initially by the Penryn estate um, associated with Penryn Castle. So the, the Asputi estate in, um, in our uh, part of Snowdonia was under the ownership of the Penryn estate. And then it came to the National Trust in 1951. Um, so during that time, it was um, ditches were dug in the peatland, and this was to enable um, an improved sort of grouse shooting estate, and subsequently more sort of agricultural improvements as well for grazing. So. Since well about two thousand, um, there there have been various phases of um, ditch blocking. Um, so basically trying to uh, fill in those man-made ditches as much as we could. Um, and we reckon, it's a ballpark figure, but we reckon about 400 kilometres of ditches have um, by now been blocked. 
um, which entails about 40,000 separate peat dams uh, installed. Some of the um, some of the reasons behind this have, have varied the, um, according to the sort of uh, the funds and the drivers behind doing doing this kind of work. But actually, what it show, showed us is um, we can have multiple benefits from restoring peatland. So some of it um, in the past has been done for carbon and habitat. Um, some has been done for water quality improvements. And then you know when you when you've done enough of it and you get to see the results, you can actually see that there are other things that um, are the benefits to doing the work as well. So um, we were focused uh, initially on flood resilience, um, slowing the flow of water by blocking these big ditches and and um, incre increasing the sort of roughness and uh, of the surface area. But then obviously, if you re-wet a landscape as well, you, you improve resilience to, to drought and to, to fire as well. So. Um, and then the, the overarching principle that we've always, you know, tried to hold on to really is that um, this land is actually tenanted, it's farmed, and there's the heritage aspect to it as well. So um, although the, the grazing levels with sheep have fluctuated from, from very high to, um, to pretty low, which is how they are today, um, you know, sheep farming has been the sort of dominant way of life um, and the, the heft system. Uh, belonging to each farm as well has been quite a, a key thing for us to, to conserve here as well. So, um, yeah, all, all of that work has had to happen in, in conversation with, with many people. So, um, some of whom are included on this slide. Uh, so, lots of different partners over the years, and we've done more um, at various times with, with some of them. The core partnership is, um, I was going to say myself and Sarah here in this uh, in, in this project, but it's actually um, there's an awful lot of people behind both of us in in our organisations that that help us undertake a lot of this work and um, make it happen. So um, we just happen to be the the leads on the project, um, pulling it all together really. So uh, national park, obviously, there's a there's a big chunk. The, the 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 majority of the land of the catchment is actually within Snowdonia National Park as well. Um, so we work a lot with the uh, National Park team um, on various bits of work. Um, RSPB as well have got a, a vested interest in and um, lots of the mignite as a blanket bog for some of the species that it hosts as well. So um, some very important bird species um, uh, live slash thrive up on the mignite, whereas in other places not not doing so well. So. Um, and then there's different organizations and local authorities um, and institu institutions that help us with some of the monitoring, um, some of the research behind a lot of the work that we do. Um, but I think that, you know, there's, there's always um, room for new partners and always room for sort of more um, or deeper conversations with existing partners as well. Um, so the river catchments within it's uh, the catchment is, is the headwaters really. So everything upstream of Better Sequoid um, in Snowdonia is kind of how we how we've um, uh, chunk this down really to to in terms of the delivery on the ground. So when we're looking at um, doing bits of work in various sub catchments, we we sort of break it down to these ten water bodies um, uh, upstream from Better Sequoid. So um, that map shows where many of them are. And then I mentioned the MiG-9 as the blanket bog. So the, this photo is actually taken with, with uh, um, my, my back to the to the blanket bog up in the hills and looking down the valley towards the Spativa. And now the, the, the river down in the gorge in the shadow there is actually up on Conway, so the, the Conway River, um, which starts its journey in Thin Conway um, at the top of the MiG-9 there. So, this is actually where it all did begin. So the grip blocking up on the blanket bog um, behind and then working down then we thought actually we can do, we can scale this up to, to more than just the uh, blanket bog and the peatland restoration. And we can actually do some uh, good sort of positive interventions on the on some of the valleys coming off the midnight and then gradually over time, it's kind of uh, scaled up to the, to the upper Conway catchment hole, which includes um, this might be a familiar scene to some of you who, who know, who have uh, traveled through North Wales, but um, 
So Avon Fikri is another sub catchment. Um, this is looking over towards that silhouetted hip peak in the middle there is Trevan and then Llinogwen in the background there, uh, the lake there. So the A5 comes right through this valley here, the Ogwen Valley. Um, this is actually one of the tributaries, uh, one of the sub catchments of, of Avon Conway, which comes as a bit of a surprise to some people actually that, um, who aren't used to thinking in terms of catchments. Um, they, they sort of look at you like you've got two heads when you mention that this water, that every drop of rain that drop, uh, falls here actually ends up in the Conway. So. Um, and then next valley along, you've got Nantagurid. Uh, so this is upstream again from Kapalkirig. The peak in the middle there with a the cloud around it is actually Snowden, so the Snowden horseshoe there. Um, the lakes there, Llanamundir, uh, uh, so up from Pasadena in the mountain centre. That's So that's one area we've been focusing as well. And then moving to the sort of south and um, again to the east again, um, there's, there's the Machna Valley, so Avon Machna. And I think this is one of the um, earlier focus areas that we we um, undertook some some work to, to make some good uh, positive changes. So um, the farm I'm about to mention, if you just uh, look at the middle of this photo here, so where the sun's coming through the valley on the left, uh, it, it actually um, highlights quite nicely where, um, where I'm about to talk about. So the farm is called Carog and it's in um, Kumpe Machna, the head of the Machna Valley. And we, the National Trust bought this farm in 2016. Um, not as a, a, a typical National Trust acquisition, which is basically, you know, um, buy something if it's under threat or if it's um, in fantastic condition and we want to keep it. So this was seen as a sort of a strategic um, uh, acquisition where we could um, work with the community and um, improve um, nature basically um, in a nutshell um, and maybe restore some of the natural processes and systems that had been previous to, to sort of um, agricultural intervention and, and landscape um, interventions over the last sort of 50 years or so or more 70 years um, so the the vision for Carog was um, as, as it sets out there we, we, we started with a, a bit of a um, just a brain dump really of what, what should be done, what it could look like for nature. So um, many of the habitats were in um, okay condition, could do better. Um, there was definitely potential for, for restoration there. So hay meadows, light grazing on the freed, wood pasture, um, increase the hedgerow um, cover there as well. And then one of the biggest parts that we thought we could do some good positive change to was um, the Avon Machna itself, the river, which has been heavily modified um, over the past, well, several, many decades. Um, and we thought we could uh, make some make some good changes here. So the the position of Carog as a farm in the community and in, in that valley was quite strategically important as well, because it linked up lots of NRW estate and um, National Trust land. So the bottom right of that image is actually the Mignite, so the brown heathery area there. And then it comes off onto NRW Forestry Estate and then down onto what was now National Trust Farm. So we could work from, we could make changes and improvements um, and restore systems for the better from the river all the way up to the, to the blanket bog. But before doing this, we um, we embarked on a, a bit of a, a campaign of engagement and um, not just consultation, but um, you know, asking the community, trying to bring them along with us, and identifying who um, some of the key um, stakeholders were, were were going to be. Really, um, we did this for the whole catchment initially, and then we sort of focused in for for the sake of Carog and had a bit of a, a more um, direct. Um, intervention there. So we had drop-in sessions in the local chapel, um, very well attended as well. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about the community of um, Kumpemachna in a second and how we've worked with them. Um, but yeah, it was. I think it's important when you're doing anything in a community that you bring people there along with you because um, you know you ignore them at your peril really because um, they can either be very strong supporters or very strong adversaries. So. Over to you, Sarah. Oh, yep, yeah, thanks, Dow. Um, so, as Dow said, it has taken a long time to, to go from a, 
a planning phase in what could be done, getting those options reports through, bringing the community with us, um, lots of dropping sessions, lots of river walks to explain what we were doing and why, because people, you know, had seen that river being maintained and managed and um, basically dredged to keep it as it was. And that's how they thought it should have been managed. So changing that perception, then getting all the permits and everything in place and to actually start doing the work took the best part of four years. But by bringing the community with us, it meant when we came to apply for planning permissions and all the various permits we needed, they were supported by the community, which meant, you know, we actually got the go ahead to start works. So before we did any work in the river at all, we undertook baseline monitoring. Um, so the Natural Resources Wales did the in-river monitoring and National Trust did the terrestrial monitoring. So I'm going to focus in on two areas where we've undertaken works. Um, they're shown on point one and two on that map. And you can see just how straight and managed that river was um, before we started the works. So this picture is taken from point one on the map. Um, basically, the river, as Dow said, has been dredged and all the dredgings were put on that left-hand side. And that shingle bank was nearly two metres high um, and probably two to three metres wide at the base, just to give you an idea of the volume. And the river itself, when we did river profiles, was like um, a canal. So basically it went down for about you know 40 centimetres, stayed at the same depth all the way across and came back up the other side. So there's no variation or change in flow really at all. Um, one of the major problems we had was trying to get all of that shingle across to the other side of the river um, without causing masses of sediment and disturbance downstream. So we had a bit of discussion of how to do that and what would you do if you're working in a forest? And then we discussed, you know, skylines. And eventually that came into the idea of using a conveyor belt. So the project officer at the time, Di Roberts, looked around and came up with the monster veyer, which is just a giant conveyor belt, really. Um, so this was put in and the digger crossed the river once to get to the other side and then started, you know, digging away that embankment. Again, this is just to give you an idea of scale for how much material was in that embankment. The monster there worked really well. And then this was it taken out completely. So what it looked like when we'd taken that embankment away. Oh, fucking hell. Let's get this And then, yeah, in flooding in next February. So the yellow line shows, you know, where the river banks would have been previously. And obviously that water has been allowed to spread out across that area. And so this is point two. So the lower embankment, this is much more of a man-made constructed embankment. So it's got big boulders that have been placed there and it had a clay core running down the middle of it. So again, we looked at removing this man-made constraint. Which we did in July 2019, removing 2,500 tonnes of the embankment, taking the boulders out and basically letting the river reconnect with that floodplain. And then the same flood in February shows that the river did indeed go all the way across the floodplain. And this is just the same area from a different angle. Um, but you can see how much space the river has been allowed to flow across by removing that embankment. And this picture shows the, the next day. So the fact that, you know, within 24 hours, the river was mainly back in its old existing channel. And I'd also started to, you know, form new channels across that floodplain. So reinstating natural processes. Back over to you, Dow. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that, some of that work was um, obviously quite stark and, and new to, to many in the community. And we thought, well, how, how do we... Um, how best to demonstrate this really in, in, a, in a sort of a visual way um, to certainly to some of the skeptics uh, that, that we'd um, had early conversations with and also to the supporters just to sort of reassure that you know some of the work here that 
the intentions um, were to reduce the impact of flooding um, or to at least demonstrate at this scale um, what could be done in, by reinstating natural processes. So this is one of the methods we used, um, a very visual way of recording maximum the maximum level of, of flood waters or flood events. Um, it's basically, it, it just um, leaves, leaves the red paint um, above where the, the high water mark has been. So we've dotted several of these across that, um, that um, reconnected floodplain in order to um, be able to calculate um, volumes of water at any given time um, stored on that particular floodplain. So quite an effective visual way of doing it. Um, again, with the visual demonstration um, and monitoring, um, it's quite important. Things things happen and change quite quickly um, when you're when you're working in this kind of um, very active and high energy um, landscape, really. So, um, I think it's important to keep that kind of photo record as we can. And um, the intention was to get the community involved in doing sort of um, regular photo photo monitoring and record keeping, and then obviously the the pandemic hit so um we weren't able to 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 do that and uh, as hoped so um that is something we'd like them to to um take on board and and help us with actually so um uh, i think that would you know um, improve any sort of involvement with the community improves their um buy-in and ownership of the, of the kind of work that we're doing as well so the community of kumpe machno i did uh, allude to them as being um very important to us in, in the stakeholder mapping. I mean, that was our first introduction to some of these people. And since that day, that first day of having a cup of tea and a biscuit and talking them through some of our ideas and plans for Carog, um, they've just become you know, good, good friends of the project um, and absolutely a, a willing army of, of people wanting to do stuff. Um, they're, they're really keen on what we're doing there um, in terms of access and conservation. There's hedge planting, seed collection, um, otter halt construction, um, putting in a, a kissing gate for some improved riverside access. And um, they're, they're basically, they're, they're, they're shaming us into providing them with more work because we can't come up with enough work for them fast enough. So um, that's, a, that's a real positive. And then some of the wildlife that are, um, uh, that we see at Carog um, and along that whole stretch of Aval Machno. Um, the otter picture bottom right is actually something we took with a with a um, with a camera that we've a wildlife trap camera. Um, so that actually lives just between both locations that Sarah mentioned. So the, the two embankments there. Um, we saw the otter there, and then all those other species of birds um, were there, but. Um, Hopefully, the uh, habitat improvements that we see there will make make it a, a much better, stronger habitat to support the, those species and more. So, um, is this you, Sarah? Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, this is another catchment they worked in. So, again, you've got Snowden in the background there. So, this is Nantagurid, which is Dufferin Mumba towards Penny Pass. Um, so, again, Another river that had been dredged had all its boulders taken out and been over deepened. So it was a case of actually looking at reconnecting the river back with its floodplain and also trying to improve the habitat. So the way you can see here is basically reprofiling a vertical bank into something that was more sloping so that the river could reconnect and flow onto its floodplain and they're just making more space for water. The river bank was held in place with, with lots of big boulders or riprap all the way along the side. So we, we took that riprap out and, and replaced, positioned it back within the main river stream. And then this, this is what it looked like when it's finished. So we've got boulders in, which gives you a variation in flow and also the, the bank that had been reprofiled behind. And as we are a catchment wide project, we also looked at planting trees and increasing the scattered feed cover and um, planting within cages to still allow grazing of cattle in the area, but also having that sapling protected. So we did that first phase back in 2020 and the tenant was really pleased with how it had gone and how it held up. 
So he asked us to, to do a bit more this year. So we reprofiled another 200 meter section of riverbank. So this is the local contractor doing that work for us. So you can see the turf was overhanging. We basically scooped that back, reprofiled the bank and then put the turf back on it. So that's providing, you know, as well as letting the river move, plant up that corridor with a nice wide buffer strip, giving shade to the river and also creating extra habitat and a wildlife corridor. Back to you, so, Dale. Yeah, Laura. Um, so what next? Um, so th this kind of project um, never, never sleeps, really. Um, we've always got something in, in the pipeline um, and we're quite sort of opportunistic when it comes to, to funding as well. That's we've, we've operated in that way for the last seven years and I think that that's going to be the way of it really um, for years to come. There's, there's always work to be done. Um, the way we do it is um, look for opportunities in certain areas, but the, the best way to, to sort of find those opportunities is by talking to some of the landowners and the, the tenant farmers that we have there and um, maybe, you know, just um, demonstrating what we've done previously and um, whether they want to um, have some of that work undertaken on their land. And this is the photo there is an example of this. Um, we had a drop in session, uh, sort of a community cup of tea and biscuit and, and chat sort of thing that, uh, in Kapalkirig. This is going back a few years now. Um, and from that, there was a, a, a conversation that started with Plaza Brenning, the outdoor centre um, in Kapalkirig, and they said, well, we, we own actually a piece of um, floodplain that's got a big embankment running across it. And you can just see that sort of snaked um, shape in the middle of the photo there. That's a, an embankment that kept Avon Llygwy out of it, out of the floodplain. Um, and they were saying in you know, really early days, but what do you think? Uh, do you want to go and take a look at that? And I think that's sort of uh, led to quite a few um, avenues of conversation about reconnecting, perhaps removing some of that floodplain, if, uh, the, the embankment, if not all of it, and reconnecting that floodplain with the river system as well, so it can make space for water. Um, there are some sort of additional considerations there because the, the habitat in question uh, within that floodplain is actually already in good quality, good nick. So there are some, uh, um, you know, careful consideration in terms of um, impacts on that already good habitat. But um, th these are the kinds of conversations a project should be looking uh, at having, really, um, and, and coming up with a, a balanced, um, well, well thought out solution. Um, so this this is an old map of, of that particular floodplain. So um, the, the blue area in the middle there is where we would hope to reconnect. That's the floodplain. Uh, you can just about see the, the sort of snaking embankment uh, coming through the middle of it. And then there's already a, a breach point where that red um, color is in the middle there. Um, and we'd like to do it in a more sort of controlled way. So the river will take back this land at some point. It's just, um, yeah, we, we wouldn't mind just having a bit more control over how that happens and when. Um, and that's just for context, really, in terms of where where that piece of land is. So the the road at the top top right is the A5. Um, for those of you who know that area, there's um, there's Cafe Shabod and there's the Brintirch pub just just up there as well. Um, looking back, this is standing on the the embankment, looking upstream. So that breach point in red is the the left arrow there. And from the Brintirch pub um, car park, actually, um, this is in the, in the upper car park, the lower car park. Obviously, you wouldn't want to park your car on this day, but um, this was going to be, um, yeah, uh, this is this kind of work is never going to stop flooding. Um, but, you know, by opening the embankment on the opposite bank there where it says Brinning and it might make space for some of this water here to, to go over there. And, there are going to be occasions, obviously, in large events that you, it's just going to go everywhere anyway. But we're looking at the sort of smaller uh, or medium, small to medium events uh, of making more space for water. And then some of the other benefits of the work that we've done. Um, we've got the top top left image there is um, species rich uh, hay meadows or just um, species rich meadows that we're we're putting in with different sort of um, plant varieties that'll 
um, diversify the, the the root systems really and the root depths um, of those plants and help with infiltration and storing water and carbon in the soil. Uh, the middle image is another um, sort of peatland um, ditch blocking site and we're continuing with that work. We're working with um, NRW's peatland program there as well on on uh, scaling up that work really for the next few years. Um, and then the right hand picture is a, a, a fenced off section of river corridor in the Thickweed, but that was delivered, on, um, our project kind of set it up um, with uh, had the discussions with a with a landowner, private landowner, um, who liked what we'd done in other places and uh, thought he wouldn't mind some additional trees on this riverbank. Um, so we worked with the National Park and the Carnedi Landscape Project to, to help fund that one. Um, and then the tree planting, um, that's our director general of the National Trust in the, in the white bubble hat there, um, planting a tree um, with Sarah there. Um, and that's on, that's in the Mahma Valley again, and that's putting more trees in the landscape. So the right trees in the right places, as, as we say. Um, and then on the left, there is um, some access improvements. So there's a, um, a permissive path that we've put in Carog in the farm. Um, and it goes to nowhere currently, but what we it actually goes to a conifer plantation managed by NRW. So we thought actually we could link this path to, to the NRW plantation and allow the people of Kumpa Machma to walk through National Trust um, Carog Farm and into the NRW plantation and create a bit of a, a circular path for them as well. So um, improving access is, is, a, is a big uh, focus for us as well. And then um, monitoring, I think ongoing monitoring, we've um, put dip wells, um, or we've contracted to put dip wells and data loggers at Brinningan to see whether that um, that floodplain I was talking about, um, you know, the impacts of, of removing that embankment would have on that floodplain. Um, so that all goes towards the sort of evidence gathering for that. Um, we've got more fixed photo points at different locations, more of those maximum um, maximum level gauges as well, uh, the, the two middle photos there. And then the right hand image is um, uh, some of the peatland monitoring work that we're putting in, baselining um, some of the hydrology uh, on our peatland sites just to see where the water table is and um, yeah, checking the sort of peat uh, or measuring the, peat, the accumulation of peat over the next few years as we, as we continue to work there. So um, yeah, establishing baseline now really for any future works is, is a key thing. So. And there's so much more to say um, and hopefully we can come back in a few years and say a bit more but um, that's it for now um, and I think we're opening for, for Q&A now. <laughs>